Now, yeah. I think any time you get pulled over by the Shawano police and they want your sobriety test, they should be able to get a picture of me and Dale Kakak, and if you could tell who is who, then you're sober, you can go home. That's so good. That's, yeah. that's a PSA announcement on behalf of uh, the Oneida Menominee Coalition. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, they'll probably think we're both Colonel Sanders. Uh, we did this last yeah. summer, me and Dale, and uh, it was a good time, so we figured we'd do another one because it's autumn. Maybe we'll make this a seasonal thing. And we're back here in Oneida at my house where I grew up in, where my dad grew up in. And uh, it's just a good feeling here, like like I said last summer, even more so. I'm going to see if I can tough it out in the winter. Uh, I was told a few years back as a heart surgery, Am I on? Yeah, we're rolling. Oh, we're rolling. <laughs> we're live as live you, can be. Oh, 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 okay. I was talking about my heart. <laughs> um, there was a guy in the Dick Cavett show, and they interviewed him a long time ago, and then they went to commercial, and the guy passed away. Oh, Isn't that something? Uh-huh. And I, 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 I wish I was on that show because I would have got a longer time to do my act. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what they did, they, they canceled the show. All right, kitty. All oh, right. Got nicer. This is our kitty. He's only going to be in this for a second. Oh. But it's just like he's running around, and I don't. I think his name is Hank. All right. So, so uh, anyway. I thought you were going to say he's only going to be in this world for a short yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, what was I going to say? Uh Dr. Evil, right? <laughs> now, how do you do that? <laughs> that was uh, Austin Powers. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, um, let me see. We can talk about a lot of things here. I'll show you a couple of things. I've been doing a lot of reading. I read a lot of different things. I try to get my material for it, from it. Okay, and this, this was uh, Smithsonian. And, and there's a good article here about the Apollo Theater and how the Little Bighorn was won. I thought this, that's a good article. Oh, yeah. What, what was that about? It was about, well, this is about when, when Custer fought the Lakotas. Oh. But I don't want to give away the ending. Oh. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want nobody to know about it. But it's a real interesting story, man. I, I, I didn't know about it before. The Dark Side of Christian History. That's my favorite. Ooh. Like a horror movie, this should go back and forth. Does that get done? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, I don't know. Hey, I seen, I heard wait, wait. mention Charlie that uh, Sherman Alexi. Speaking, Alexie. speaking um. of museum pieces, um, <laughs> go ahead. I heard you were honored at uh, Denver Film Festival, a Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah. How did that feel? I mean, how how did you earn that? And what went into that, and how how did how did it feel to get an award of that? Well, well, you know, I used to I used to play in Denver a lot a long time ago, when I was Charlie Hill of the seventies, <laughs> and and uh, I used to play the comedy clubs when it was happening there. That's back when Roseanne she was my opening act, and then I also at the same time played for the Native community for a lot of years. I played. Uh, God, countless shows. Uh, the Oyate Indian Club at the University of Colorado. I remember the Denver Indian Center in the mid-'70s. The old Indian Center was a uh, on the top of it. This old building was a, a synagogue that wasn't used for like t- 15, 20 years, and it was empty. It was right above the Indian Center, so they cleaned it out. And uh, I did a show with Jesse Ed Davis. That was great. That's the first time I ever... Uh, met him or seen him that was a good old time i i don't know i should have hung on to that poster and uh anyway they gave me they honored me and i'm real apprehensive about awards so to speak an award is different from being honored when indian people honor you then it's it's a real blessing that's how i look at it i uh, i think awards itself are just uh, uh what do they call them the badges of mediocrity that's what awards are People get caught up in that, and it's not about awards. It's about uh, it's about the journey. And I also think with awards, it's almost like I noticed that with Vine, Deloria, and Floyd, they start getting awards. And I'm thinking, gee, this is a preliminary to a tombstone, you know? 
joined the army when I was 24. But anyway, I was real, real grateful. Uh, some Lakota drummers sang, and some, there were some nice words said. And uh, the Maori people gave me a nice jade necklace, really nice. And I should have wore it for the interview, but boy, was that sweet. So I was real happy and honored to get that. And and uh, yeah, yeah. So so it kind of it kind of felt good. I guess before when somebody would kind of bring those kind of things up, I didn't want to be in it. But I realized later I should just accept my goodness coming to me. And and it and it felt good. I got the shirt. My granddaughter, my wife, everybody came out there. So Denver is a good Indian community. Yeah, it must have felt good to be recognized, yeah. you know, for for the work yeah. you put into it. I know it ain't easy being funny. Well, maybe maybe they thought I was Dale Kakak and <laughs> got got your award, horse. <laughs> well, if you need a double, there we go. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so I remember last time you were here, we were, we were doing the the pictures together and all that. That was pretty good. Let's see what else was I reading here. Uh, oh. Jerry Mathers as the beaver. You got to have that. I saw this in the library now that when I got to read this. And uh, it, it was just a white bread show that we grew up on watching. And, and it's just funny watching it, how it endured so long. Uh, uh, let's see what else I have here. Oh, 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 oh. Wait, I'm getting back in the shot here. Don't go nowhere. I feel like Carrot Top doing this. Just, if you want, I'll pull back. No, no, that's okay. Whatever. We'll just, we'll just. I was, uh. I was just reading the New York Times the other day, man. There's really, really some uh, really interesting things in here. Reading about this banana democracy, and uh, <laughs> i got to finish the article, but you should pick up the New York Times sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, that's what I say to that. I saw this one. That's been out a while. The worst uh, case scenario handbook. How to escape killer bees, how to fend off a shark, how to take a punch, how to deliver a baby to taxi cab. Now, all of this could happen in one night in Kashina to one person. So uh, <laughs> this could happen. But I like looking at this. I, I try to read everything so I can get material. That's what I do. I was looking at the Course of Miracles, but I didn't believe it because there's not one mention of Smokey Robinson. And, uh, yeah. Physics of the Impossible. That's that's this one. Oh, have you heard of that book? No, Macheo Kaku though he's um. You know about the guy? Yeah. Macheo Kaku. Is that how you say it, or Michio Kaku? You heard of this I, guy? I, I, okay. I listen, to, I listen to him on the radio. He gets wow. interviewed on uh, talk radio late late at night. Yeah. On AM. Yeah, I've heard of this. I'd like to hear him. Coast to coast AM. He talks about a scientific exploration into the fields of. Uh, Phasers, force fields, teleportation, time travel. And I think, I mean, uh, the, the holy ones and the medicine men, we, they were talking about this stuff a long time ago. They didn't call it quantum physics, but this is, uh, it's good knowledge, but it's ancient knowledge to Indian people. You know, we knew about astrology. We knew, shit, we knew it all. We did it all. So, uh, and then there's, uh, remember this one? The chronology of Indian history. You know, when I was a kid, I remember reading Indian history books. It would be uh, a great big thick book about Indian people, uh, starting with the Columbus coming, and you go through it all, and then it would be the last three pages. Indians of today. And you'd see a picture of Peter MacDonald and Jim Thorpe. And that's it. <laughs> Once in a while, ate a deer, if the book was made by the 60s but or 70s. But it, it, they would only go up into that, and they'd just mention a couple of people, and then it would just end that way. It was like Indians of the day. And, and uh, so I thought this was pretty interesting. What, what year did you guys have your thing at the novitiate? 1975. 1975. Give it out, Pine Ridge. Oh, Alexian Brothers, Roman Catholic novitiate. Alexian Brothers order resends its offer to the deeds of the Menominee tribe of Wisconsin. It's novitiate in Gresham, Wisconsin, for you, blah, 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 blah. So did you guys get it or not? I always, you almost got it, and they changed their mind? Yeah, yeah. They said they'd give it to you so you guys would get out of there? They lied to you? The oldest trick in the book, yeah. yeah. The Catholic <laughs> Church lied to the Indians? Sure, we'll the That's a mortal sin. <laughs> Which reminds me of the old joke. This kid, 
gets run over by a bus. A guy runs over. He says, don't worry, son. I'll call a priest. The kid says, how can you think of sex at a time like this? (laughs) You know why a lot of Indians talk like this? Because they went to boarding school going, are you done, father? Are you done? Which... So with the boarding school, that's the thing, too. People are still uh, paying the price for that. I think there were psychological scars, physical beatings, sexual abuse. A lot of it's kind of coming to the surface now, but I think there was countless times it never went reported. Uh, All that stuff, they had free reign on us, these these people. And uh, some people were so uh, beaten down that they never wanted to talk about it. I mean, uh, uh, and they'll internalize it, and then we, and then because of that, we take it out on our own kind. I think we we've been abused so much, we abuse each other's a lot. That's we, any you find any abused child, he'll do that to the one after him. So I think we took so much abuse from from these missionaries and the Catholic Church and any other church. And uh, like I said, I was abused in Catholic schools, and that's why I go out at night and talk to people sitting in the dark. That's what brought me to that. So, anyway, I don't see no black cat here. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? Well, I remember. Um, I think one thing that would be interesting in talking about the issues uh, Native people face today—the the boarding school stuff, um, cat, um, Catholicism, inflicting wounds. Yeah. Um, where where did you um, at, come to the decision where uh, you would confront these issues uh, with comedy? Oh, geez. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think people who went to boarding schools, probably your own kinfolk too, uh, when they'll sit around together and they'll reminisce about, oh, I remember in boarding school we had to bring our own bed spread, we had to do this and that. So they talk about these stories and though they were painful, they, they tell them in a humorous way. Uh, there was a guy here at the Episcopal Church uh, for years in the 60s. Uh, he had a big ass, and the community called him Father Buns. And to this day, we talk about Father Buns. And, 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 and uh, oh, God. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I'd had bring him up or whatever. But it just it just seems like uh, it's how did I get to talk? Oh, Father Buns was a good a good thing. And then later on, we find years later he was kind of sniffing around the Oneida kids. Yeah. Uh, so we, I never knew about that. And people told me later on was we grew up. And of course, I was a Catholic, so uh, he couldn't eat my ass on Friday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, um, I had a cousin once. She said she got a, a, a molested by a priest. And she told her folks and told everybody nobody believed her because these people had such a, a, a grip and a hold on people. And I think, how can somebody assume that because they put these garments on, they're closer to God than you. I think that's the height of arrogance. I'll put on this costume and I can have all this mental control over you, put you in a mental prison. And I also think with Catholics, they, they uh, what do they call it, the largest cult in North America? And and they're all the same. It's all the same. You know, what did Floyd say? Because religion is big business, as your bank accounts will tell. And Christ died to save all mankind, but that was long ago. Yeah, yeah. So we all kind of go through that, and we're, we're kind of paying for it. And I started doing comedy with it because I remember the mean nuns, and I remember the the priests, and, and I always thought the nuns could beat the shit out of the priests because they, they just... Looked like that, you know, was Sister Ralph or or Father Francis, you know, who's going to win the fight? So it was that kind of stuff. And it also was a release from from uh, just the pain of going through the bullshit, you know. Uh, that's so, when I started talking about it. So um, what, <clears throat> is there a defining moment? I don't know if we covered this last time, a defining mm. moment in your life when... Um, you said, I'm going to be a comedian. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a, I guess when I, I, I grew up watching it on TV, it was kind of a secret wish I had. And I've said this many times, and and I'd watch these people, and I just think that was so cool. You know, I remember as a kid on the Saturday, after all the work was done here, 
and I did my minimal share of it. We would go upstairs, up to the hill to the uh, Oneida Mission because they had showers. We'd pay the guy a quarter, and we'd take a shower, and we had to sit in the water of, of uh, or stand in the water of the previous family. <laughs> but we were glad to have it. Then we'd come home, my mom would make chili or something, and then we'd watch Decky Gleason and then Gunsmoke. But the comedians is, is what it was. Yeah, yeah. And and so that's when it kind of set in. Then I remember just sitting over here at my kitchen table, and I just thought, I'm going to I'm gonna go for it. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to learn how to do it. And I sat down with a notebook and wrote every every funny thing I ever heard of. Right over there. Right over there. Right, right here, 10 feet away. Yeah, I thought, shit. Awesome. I, I, uh, I dropped out of school, and I didn't want to get drafted, and I didn't want to work in the goddamn paper mill here. And I thought... I'm going to find a way to do this. I'm going to, f- I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to find a way. I'm going to, I'm going to, so that's what I did. And, and, I, and I kind of willed it into my life, I guess. Uh, one thing that inspired me was when I was a kid, I watched this comedy team called Alan and Rossi. And one guy had, it was a fat, dumpy guy, a Jewish guy with curly hair and a handsome singer, Italian singer named Steve Rossi. And they were the worst comedy team I've ever seen in my life. Even when I was 11 years old, I thought, these guys are awful. They suck. They're so bad. And they made me so angry that there's got to be a door in show business these guys came in. you got to be able to If Alan and Rossi. You know, they, they would tell a stupid joke, and every punchline they'd end it with, hello there, hello there. And uh, I just thought, you know, screw you, Alan and Rossi. Hello there. You know, I re- I remember they were on Ed Sullivan when the Beatles were on, and the Beatles just buried these guys. And after the Beatles, who wanted to hear these assholes? But uh, anyway, that was that's. Thank you, Alan and Rossi, for inspiring me. Hello there. Yeah. Hey, Bob, did you have the keys? Were they in ignition? Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, that's my daughter. She brought one of my Cadillacs home. I have a fleet of them in my garage. I got a big hanger like Jay Leno. In fact, Jay Leno comes in and he waters my lawn once a week. And uh, <laughs> anyway, back back to the interview. So what? And, uh, that was a, a a beginning in in that time. And throughout your career now, I know you. What has comedy meant to you? What have comedians meant to you? Career. I'm sitting here talking to one Menominee at <laughs> night with one camera. This is a hell of a career. <laughs> but I'm teasing. I'm teasing. This is actually, it's an honor to be interviewed by a guy who looks like me. Yeah. I feel like I'm Don Rickles now sitting here. Hey, I worked with him one time. It was a thrill. When I was a kid, I thought he was funny. Then when I got around college, I thought he's part of the establishment. He was tired, just old, old. And then when I got to work with him once on a TV show, I thought he's just like all the comedians I know, except he's older. He was here before me, real improvisational and, and just riffing. And I remember uh, talking to him for a while, and he was a real nice guy. And I, and I said, you know, you look like a basketball coach I had once. He said, a basketball coach? He said, where are you from? And I said, Wisconsin. And he says, who are your people? I said, well, we're the Oneida, so we're uh, Woodland Indians. Then he looks around the room at everybody else, and he goes, so I'm talking to the Indian like I'm the wagon master. And I thought that was so funny because it was so old school. It just it just killed me. So so uh, I, I just thought that's, yeah. So I, I enjoyed working with him, and I like that. He's he's an old guy now. He must be close to 90, and he's still going strong. So part, part of this whole thing was I got to meet all the comedians. I always liked just about all of them that I liked I worked with. I never met Bill Cosby. He he was one of my heroes, and I and of course I went on before about Richard Pryor, and then as I came up, what did you ride, Dale? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know where Apisonic it is? No, no. <laughs> my daughter, that's that she used to say is Apisonic lot because when we, she was a little girl, he used to rent our garage out, and. Uh, and he came out to be a serious actor, and he did classical things like Punky Brewster. And uh, <laughs> I just teasing. I don't know where AP is, but it's a shout out to him. 
I know he's been clinically dead for 25 years, but he, but you wouldn't know it if you see him at powwows. So that's that. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that you <coughs> you said you'd like to uh, talk with about uh, comedians and. Oh yeah, yeah. You're gonna throw out the names. I can tell you who I know or what they're like or whatever. But I remember being at the comedy store and and I auditioned and I was in line with Letterman and Mike Michael Keaton. And all these guys were my peers, and a lot of them became stars or went on other other kind of things. So I, I got to learn and grow with all of them, and I, I think that's what I miss a lot about not being in L.A. for now is all the comedians. So there's like a whole camaraderie and a kind of an energy that people have, especially the real good ones. So some comedians will get up, and they're just funny people. There are some comedians that get up, they're only funny as their jokes are. A good example was Bob Hope. He would get up and he would tell a joke. But without his writers, he, he wasn't funny at all. Or somebody like Groucho, it came from the gut. See, that's what I like when it comes from the gut, comes from the heart. And and even if it's something sl- s- silly, like the Stooges, they came from the heart because it was raw. I still love it. If you watch them real closely, there's a rhythm to what they do. It looks real chaotic when you watch it, but when you watch them, it's one, two, three, Four. It's kind of like almost like martial art moves, because they had to learn how to do that to make it look real on camera. Then they would put the sound effects in it. And once, in a, you know, when they do the poke in the eye, they would do it on the forehead. And if you do that, so uh, yeah, so so uh, that was another one. I loved watching them. I used to try to watch everything that was funny when I was a kid. I mean everything. So that's that's what I'm. I, I and, and and I just like meeting all the folks. I don't know. What about um, Richard Lewis? Ever met him? Richard Lewis, he's always going through his hair and he's always pacing. Yeah, he came before me. He's a, and he, yeah, neurotic plus. He was kind of like Woody Allen on speed. It's the same kind of thing. He's just neurotic, and he was a funny guy. He never really had an act full of jokes. He just would go on and ramble on about crazy shit. Another Lewis I love even better is uh, Lewis Black. And he's, he's, I don't think he hit it till he was 60. And he's, he's around now. And he's, he's really funny. He's got real smart stuff, political. And he's just, you might have seen him, an older guy with glasses. And he just rants. And he's got something to say. Uh, I think uh, Dennis Miller blows. I think he sucks the big wazoo. He's kind of like a kid who uh, doesn't want to get his pants dirty because he's a rich kid. You know that kind of a uh, vibe. Those kind of kids you just want to on a playground. So he was a uh, he was he kind of sold out and went over to the other side. And so that's him. Uh, I never cared for Bill Maher, even though I like the idea of what he's doing. I think a couple of times because he's such a snotty asshole. And the other one is in uh, in and I'm of course sugarcoating this. Also with him is uh, him and Dennis Miller what I call safe bad boys. They got this persona as they're outlaws or they're bad boys on TV. But if they really were, people would be threatened by them and they wouldn't have mine, you know. So, so, uh, geez, I remember on cable, just for a brief time, Russell Means at his show. I thought, oh, my aching red brother. It, I think it lasted 10 minutes, but, but I thought that was funny. Ow! Okay, all right, all right. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know if he came out with horns or a monologue, but I think it was just a talk thing. So, I don't know. Uh, 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 let's see. Shirley Hemphill was there when I started out. And she was on What's Happening. Uh, I know you're going to have to ask me because I, I, I just ramble on here and sometimes I forget people. Oh, well, what about George Bush? You think you, you would not kill a comedian? <laughs> oh, my son, when he was little, he called him Ush, George Ush. Uh, which means uh, insect in Navajo. So either Bush, they're, they're, uh, I just think it's sad. I mean, you know, either Bush. Uh, one guy's in the CIA. Once you're in it, you're always in it, I think. I think he was a killer, a, sh- a wimp in sheepskin. That was a wolf. Yeah, but Bush, is, they're tired. They're gone. You know, they, the guy's got a book out now, and you know damn well he didn't write it. I mean, he's the most illiterate or semi-literate, I'll give him that, president we ever had. He, he was just painstakingly dull and stupid. Now he's got a book. Yeah, yeah, I'll buy that. 
it, it's all, it's all. You know, somebody asked me about the elections and when I thought about them now, and I thought it's, it's just, it's just different clowns, same circus, different clowns, and it doesn't matter if it's GOP or Democrats. Democrats uh, seem to favor us on surface, or their sympathy is toward Indian people. But by and large, both sides don't understand us. They, it's a disconnect from reality. I remember uh, earlier this summer, I went to Washington, D.C. It was a thing called One Nation. I guess previously they had a thing with Glenn Beck and uh, Sarah Paleface went over to Washington, D.C. to do this thing on Martin Luther King's birthday on the Lincoln Monument. And I'm thinking they're desecrating his name with that bullshit. Somehow, because we got a, 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 a black president or a half-breed, that white people somehow have this stupid illusion that they're somehow a prosecuted, persecuted minority. I'm going to eat my indigenous shorts, all right? Just So when we went to this thing, this thing was supposed to counter it, right? All the lefties are coming. They wanted me to perform on it, and I thought, well, I can't perform to that many people because uh, you can't get a rhythm at a rally. I mean, I've done a lot of rallies in my time, uh, aim rallies, no nuke rally, whatever, and when you tell a joke, they don't laugh. They think it's a declaration. So you go out there and you go... Because most rallies are, motherfucker, motherfucker, yeah, right on, motherfucker. Ah. So when you tell a joke at a rally, I'll say, I'm not from L.A., I'm originally from Oneida. Yeah, right on. It's like, you you know, so so ba- basically I thought I could make a, a funny visit or whatever. And my hero, Dick Gregory, was in it. He was sitting in the audience, and I gave him a shout-out because he was my idol. He's the guy that really inspired me. And I was so pleased that he was there, and I just said, I wouldn't be up here wouldn't for you. And it was just like a wave of of, uh, of acknowledgement. It was mostly African Americans there, and they all knew who he was. And and Brother Gregory has, to me, even though he wasn't part of the program, he has more depth than anybody that was up there. I remember flying on a plane with Jesse Jackson, and I met him a few years earlier. They talk about him being a preacher. Well, okay. But he's the coldest son of a bitch I ever met. If he's supposed to be a man of God, maybe I caught him on a bad day. But I, I seen him and I met uh, Sharpton, and I thought these guys, uh, they're like the showbiz people I'm around. It's the same bullshit. It's, it's, it's uh, all politicians actually. They, they, they have that same energy as showbiz people, as actors. It's all bullshit, image, and money, and there's no depth to any of it. And I thought. Somebody told me they wanted to interview Jesse Jackson for an Indian paper. Maybe it was you. I don't know. And his people turned it down because he wasn't knowledgeable in that. And then Sharpton, I just thought, holy shit. He'd have been a good uh, AIM member because he was, he was just, just so uh, out there. But with him, it was style and I don't know any substance. I think they're just showbiz people. I mean, but also I'm thinking they don't know anything about Indians. And so when I went out there... Uh, I, I, I thought, Jesus, if I talk about the flag or should I mention Abe Lincoln hung 38 Indians, open up with that on the Lincoln Monument, and I thought, well, I don't have a punchline for that. <laughs> yeah, well, Indians sure love to hang around, Shakopee, you know. But, but I'm thinking they wouldn't get it, and if I did do that, they would vilify me. They know how to do that with the media. So I just thought, I just I said, you know, you, you call this one nation, so it's appropriate you had the landlord come. So I took that position. And 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 then I, I basically talked to them. But every other person there, I thought, they did the same thing. You know, it was 40 years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King said, then they do a watered-down version of what he said. And they all sounded the same. And I thought, when I was talking, a couple of things. One was, a few things I would mention was was uh, they would be kind of stunned. Like I started out singing, this land is my land. And I was going to do it to all those American flags, but I thought they wouldn't get it. And I thought, and they kind of froze on that. And I thought what I always kind of knew, that they don't get us. America doesn't get Indians. They really don't. Whether it's liberal or conservative, they don't get us. They don't get us. There's a disconnect from reality when it comes to us. 
I, 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 that's obvious, you know, a real disconnect from reality. And so, so when you tell them something real, you're kind of uh, rearranging their mental luggage. So uh, anyway, that was my first joke. <laughs> Somebody said America is a great idea, but it has not been invented yet. So I like that. Now watch me get audited. <laughs> uh, so what do we, um, what, what do Native people, what are we up against? What have we been up against? What are we up against now? Um, and uh, where, where do you think we're, we're bound? Uh, I just think all we got to do is outlast them. They look like they're killing each other off. <laughs> I just think it's just stick to the life plan, you know. Uh, I think you can't change anything but yourself. I really think that. And I think Indian people know the secret of survival. I remember talking to a young Mohawk guy, and he says, you know, we're, we're called the caretakers of the land, but what are we supposed to do? And I said, I don't know. I'm still caught up in being the landlord of the Western Hemisphere. I'm worried about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we're, what, we're, the, we're the landlord. The rent is due, you mother. Yeah, uh, um, I, I think if we just stay strong and walk the spiritual walk, which has always got us through everything, that's what's going to do it. I think long ago when they tried to destroy us, they went after our beliefs. So the political system and cultural would kind of house of cards. It's all connected. So I think that's what's really going to happen. And, and we're going to be around. I mean, hell, they, they can't get rid of us, man. And... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to be here in Oneida. It's like Buffy St. Marie told me once. If I'm the last Indian in the North America, I'm still sovereign. I don't care if I'm the last one, the only one around, I'm sovereign. And I, I think we should embrace that more and more instead of talking it and, and letting our local redneck communities kind of try to dictate what they're doing to us. But when you think about it, we're up against things that we were talking about a generation ago. We're talking about things that uh, before that, we're still up against everything. There's not one reservation where everything is all right. Where everything, oh, this is okay. This is fine. But if you hire Charlie Hill to come to your casino, it'll solve, no, no. <laughs> oh, my God. Nobody, nobody has more fun than a couple of idiots. <laughs> they sit out there in the dirt and just laugh their asses off at nothing. So, I don't know. I hope this comes off. The other one we got kind of lucky with. It was daytime, and we'll see what happens, but we'll see. Yeah. What, what do you want? Anything else? Um, any- oh, 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 I want to mention, too, I was at Menominee College briefly. Uh, my, sis- my sister, my daughter had some business there, so I went there real quickly, but that's that's one of the most beautiful campuses I've ever seen. And the Manams, man, that's like I told I said to Dale here, it's the crown jewel of your nation. Man, that is really something. And I think as time goes on you're really gonna uh benefit from it. But I, I just I just like the look of it, the feel of it, and it's it looks like a brand new. It has that feel like a new car. I know it's been here a little while, but it's still new to me. And, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So if you're tr- you're part owner then, right? If it's your That's tribe, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. That's nice. Yeah. yeah it, it's working out. It's um, they're a young college, seventeen years. Yeah. 17 yeah. Seventeen years old and. Is seventeen? Mm-hmm. So when it started, was in another building or something? Yeah, and the the uh, Dr. Fowler is the founding president. And she started having classes in her basement. Really? Yeah. And then they got a trailer, a double wide trailer. And then they got a building. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was told that the first American studies program ever was was the AIM guys in the penitentiary. That's when they first started doing that. Because before that, they didn't have it in any college. They, nobody even thought of that stuff. And and I thought that's real interesting. I mean, if if whatever, that's a, a great contribution. People don't realize. So they had their. Uh, it kind of started in the joint, and I think they did that in conjunction with. Uh, 
I think they took this Dale Carnegie help. That's what I've, I was told, and apparently that that self that self help. And then they got out of the joint, and then they started helping themselves. <laughs> I just think uh, I see. I'd like to see all those brothers get together and have a reunion, and whatever differences, just reconcile and let it slide. Because if everybody just let it go, whatever, it might have a ripple effect on everybody else. Because years ago when everybody stood up and took a stance, we all wanted to do that in our own way, in our own communities. So that's that's what I think the contribution was. And uh, and then they got to quit making shitty movies. <laughs> there are trained actors out there, you guys. Take your chokers and shades and go home. I don't need to see Russ and Lass and the fucking Mohicans. as like Malcolm X in a Tarzan movie. I don't need to see Eddie Benton on Plymouth Rock, even though he was probably there in real life. Um, the the Belcourts never got into the movies. I think I think they were Minnesota, so they were probably going to get in the WWF. I don't know. But anyway, I'm I'm teasing all you guys, of course, and. Uh, I'm hoping you'd say, well, let's wrap it up with. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, can you, what could you say? That's what you want to say anything? Come on in and talk. <laughs> what what can right. you say to the, the younger folks like that? My nephew, he, he, uh, he heard about you when he was like nine years old, and now they're of age with families of your own, and they're making decisions in their life, you know. Uh, they got... Uh, Traditions to learn and, and to follow. What was that, that line you told me about you said you are going to come see me? Yeah. What did he yeah. say? I Listen to this, Bob. Charlie Hill, that guy. You mean the comedian from the 70s? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the comedian from the 70s. Like the man from Laramie. Yes, I'm from the 70s. He's back today, but he's really from the 70s. I think that's really funny because that's when I came up. Uh, I don't know what to say to the kids except uh, that's what everybody says. I don't know what to say to them. Then they talk to them for an hour, right? Uh, basically, I would tell them what I told my own kids, you know, uh, get me the paper and get the hell out of my room. <laughs> that's what I would say to the kids. I think <laughs> I, th- I think to me today, kids are people 30 and under. Uh, when I say college kids, I mean, to me, they look like kids now. Before, they were like college kids. But I I think they're way smarter than we are book wise. I I think kids when they're even little babies they're as smart inherently as we are. They just don't have the life experience yet. So I just say uh, put your spiritual thing first, and then everything else will follow. You know everything else is details. Uh, I I like to quote Floyd on this. Uh, Floyd Westerman he said, "The purpose of life is to help other people." And that's that. And I thought, well, that's what he did his whole life. And I think if you do that, everything else will have a ripple effect. I think I think if you want to be something in your field, learn out who the best one is. Not just uh, the res, men, men, just the best in the world. If you want to be a surgeon, doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, whatever, find out who the best one in the world is and then elevate yourself to that level. That's what I say. And if you don't know your language, uh, learn ten words of it. If you don't go to the ceremonies or you haven't learned, you can burn tobacco every day. You can, you know, uh, grandfather hears all the prayers. And and then uh, somebody said, ask an elder every day, what can I do for you? What can I do for you, da- uh, Dale? <laughs> <laughs> That's not funny. You know, it's funny when they call us elders now, and I'm thinking, I don't, you know, like I was 80, with well, 60 is a new 40. 40 is the new 30, which I think is a crock when you when your body is so sore from something. And that's then, a, well, that's actually what I, I, I was going to want to finish up. Yeah. With, um, how, do you, how does it feel? Uh, how do you like getting older? Well, I love getting older when you think about the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. You know, when I, when I talk about somebody 70... Uh, that don't look so old no more, you know. And and I'm 59, so I'm in my 
my late 50s. <laughs> That's funny. I, I'm amazed how fast things went by, but it's been a pretty good ride. And I'm, people say, I come home and I see people want to retire. Well, I said, I'm not going to retire. I'm getting ready to, to refire. You know, there's a big difference. So getting old, I love all these things you know about that you didn't know about maybe 10 years ago. Sometimes you forget more. And and I also think what what I like is you when you get older, you don't deal with the physical as important anymore. You deal with what's important. You don't have to bother with the trivial no more. You, you deal with what's in your mind and in your heart. You kind of go that way more. So I, I, I love it, and I love seeing people that I haven't seen for a long time. And so how did you get through the 80s and 90s and all that stuff? Uh, but once again, I get back to my friend uh, Gina from Kashina. She said, gee, when we talk about the 70s, it's, it's like our parents talking about the 1940s. And I thought, oh, God. So anyway, uh, welcome to another session with Uncle Charlie. <laughs> That's what my my uh, sister in law calls me. Her kids don't call me that, but she does. So apparently, I'm her uncle. Yeah. All right, ready? Uh, oh, oh, and cut. Are you? Okay. You ready? What? I'm all ready. I I I I quit half an hour ago. I thought I was just gonna talk to you. Fell to fucking sleep. <laughs> all right, I got it. Last time it was daytime and hot. Tonight, it was, so we'll do it in the springtime again. Later on, you know, I was thinking, geez, I didn't get to talk about all the comics I really wanted. Yeah, that's what I was trying to lead up to. We could still kind of go there if you want. You yeah. got a little time. This one's still, uh, that one's still rolling. We didn't lose all right. that one. All right, let's do that. All right, we're back. N- name name ones you know. We could kind of do that. I gave them whatever food you had in there, and oblivious to the interview going on still. Yeah, I fed your cat. And and uh, give them some milk. I thought it was interesting. They both shared everything, at least so far. I, I don't really know them, but there's these young guys out on the powwow jam. The comedy powwow highways? Yeah, powwow comedy jam. They, they're called, and they go around. Well, those guys were on the Showtime special that I got yeah. to co-produce. Yeah. I got to uh, give them their shot and all that. They, they, they were pretty funny. They had some good stuff. It's... it's uh, there's a lot of guys that are, are funny that are coming out. People should hear. For, I'm talking about Native comics. There's a comedy team, Navajo guys, James and Ernie. They, <laughs> they're incredible. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but uh, no. they're very, very funny. And they get better each time, and they're starting to branch out and play uh, to other places other than the Navajo Nation. Uh, James and Ernie, man. Look them up. Uh, Larry Omaha, of course, was on the show with me. Um, who the hell else? There's a lot of people, man, coming up now. Uh, there's a guy named Pox Harvey. He's another Navajo guy. I thought he's, he's, I like him a lot. And then I saw Russell Means as a kid. His name's Tatanka. And he's learning, he's at the beginning stages of being a comedian. And I thought, I said, talk about your old man. I said, I said, right away, you're going to laugh saying his name. I said, because people are, are afraid of him. Plus, What's he like as a dad? You don't have that insight. I mean, really, they don't know that. I said, I said, you could go so much with that, and then and then he'll beat the shit out of you, and you can, you can, that could be the act. You do your act, he beats the shit out of you. You need to take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, buddy, Big Mountain, he's a, he's a comedian, but he's more of a ventriloquist, and I think that's a lost art. I think he's great, and and. But he has has his, uh, he don't call them dummies, they call them figures. His wife told me that. She says, they're not dummies, they're figures. I remember when I met Buddy, he says, yeah, me and Wendell, we were in Chicago, and then we're going to Detroit and in Milwaukee. I said, no, you're going to Chicago and Milwaukee. Wendell's a dummy. But that's how he talks, man. So his wife said to me, when they asked me what my husband does, he says, well, he, he, uh, talks to himself while he plays with dolls. That's how she described it. So, you know, I wanted to be a comedian as a kid. I really did. I was eight years old, and I sent away for this, this dummy. I, I saved all my money, and my daddy helped me. I was eight years old, and the dummy came. It was Jerry Mahoney. Fucking great, man. And I get it, and my brothers and sisters were older, and they said I was playing with a doll. 
and I got really mad, and I, I tore the head off in the arms. I was so pissed off at them for saying that, and, and I mean, really, no encouragement at all in my family, <laughs> and, and uh, I thought, Jesus Christ, I could have played all the big rooms now. I could have been a ventriloquist in Vegas, you know, hi, hi, you know, my brother's an asshole. He sure is. You know, I could do all that stuff. <laughs> Can you drink water? Look at it. I have a soda cart. So anyway, I still had the book, How to Be Ventriloquist. And the next day I took it to school, and the nun took it away because it wasn't a, a school book. And I got no encouragement being a ventriloquist at all. So, so when I wanted to be a comedian, I just kept my mouth shut. <laughs> Fuck. Man, this is a tough room here. Uh, other comedians, there's a very funny woman in L.A. She's, a, she, she's from Oklahoma. Her name is uh, Arrogant Star, and she plays guitar. She's a playwright, a comic actress. Uh, she draws comic strips, Indian comic strip. She, she's one of the most versatile, gifted people I've ever met, and we, we perform together a lot. Uh, let me see. There's, there's more people there. Uh, Omaha. Larry, Larry. Larry Omaha. I mentioned Larry Omaha. Yeah. I call him Larry Nebraska. But he... <laughs> He came a few years after I did. He's in our Showtime special. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then with the uh, powwow comedians, uh, they, they're all different tribes, different nations. And so when the Showtime thing came out, it showed everybody's got a different stroke, everybody's got a different voice, different style, whatever. But I, I thought uh, we went to some gathering once, and I'm going, the, all these guys are wearing suits. All of them wearing suits. And all of them are married to... Except one, two, what, 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 white women. And I thought, why don't you guys just call yourself the BIA comedians? I mean, that, that would fit with the suits and the, all that. But they're just jokes. I mean, that's how we talk to each other. We just go for it. But I like that, that uh, uh, everybody's getting around. But there's, there are people out there. Some people do things, uh, the late Vincent Craig, he was a storyteller, joke teller, very funny guy. He had, he had a comic strip called Mutton Man. He passed away last, oh God, this summer, this spring. He was he was an Indian legend. And he, songs about the code talker. He had a famous song called Rita, about stealing the candy bar and the res. And it, it was a big, big comedy hit. So, so there are a lot of creative natives out there. But I always say... Uh, push the envelope, go a little further with it, do that. I think to a certain extent, y you got to really, uh, I mean, it's good to reflect on where you're from, what you're doing, but if you want to cross over, you got to really get out there with stuff. So I love Indian humor, and I do what I call Indian humor in somewhat, but I go to other areas. I think if you just, how many fry bread, commodity, Indian car jokes can you tell? I mean, but everybody's got a different twist, and they come up. So there's a wealth of that, and I like about that is only we get that. I call those kind of jokes private stash. It's only for Indians or people who live in our world. A very funny guy uh, working, he's a Apache guy named Drew Lacapa. He's one of the funniest guys I ever met. And he does his whole bit about when he weighed over 300 pounds and he's in the sweat lodge and how hell it is just trying to get comfortable in there and, and it's, rocks are too hot and he's trying to lay down and... It's it's brilliant, man. As as Drew, and, and and you see things that you wish you would have thought of it. Uh, there's a Navajo guy, uh, Yazi, no Yafi, Mark Yafi. He talks about being Navajo and he's adopted. And he said there's six thousand Navajos, and there's five names. <laughs> and, and I thought that's pretty funny. And he does this bit about a Navajo basketball game. Yazi to Begay, Begay shoots, blocked by Yazi. Yazi back to Begay, Begay, Begay back to Yazi. Yazi back to Yazi. And, and I'm thinking, that's just how it sounds. And I would have loved to have had that bit. But that's great, you know. So, so uh, yeah, so the Showtime thing is kind of rotating now, and I hope we, we were trying to get work off it and stuff, but everybody kind of splintered out. And I think the BIE comics went one way, and we're getting work uh, in different kind of, combinations of it and mostly uh i like going out with a buddy uh, uh, like doing that and i like going out alone and everything too so i i just uh the long as i've done it i like it more and more the performing part i still think i'm still learning it but 
I don't like the bullshit that comes with it anymore. You know, when 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 you go to some club in Pittsburgh, and some guy head of entertainment and salads is telling you what kind of show to do. So I long long quit listening to that. You know, I remember one time doing something for a, it was the Indian White Business Conference somewhere in Minnesota, and I remember in my room around noon doing what most comedians do, getting high and watching cartoons. <laughs> and I get a <laughs> gotta get inspired, you know. So I get a call from a guy, this whoa, 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 whoa white man. He says, Hi, uh I'm on the committee and blah blah blah. And we'd like you to come down here uh this afternoon so we can go over your speech. I says, go over my speech. What the fuck is it? High school? You gonna go over my speech? So I figure I'll humor this guy and I go down there and there were four whoa, whoa, white people. And one Indian, and they're really nervous about what I'm going to do at the banquet. And I knew damn well that's what it was, but I'm just going to play dumb. And I, I just sat there and made him ask all these questions. And then one guy says, so what do you do up there? And I says, I don't know until I get there. He says, well, what do you talk about? I says, I don't know until I get up there. <laughs> and then And then one guy blurts out, are you offensive? And I said, well, I could be perceived that way. But but you know what I did with those bastards? And I did the same thing once at the BIE building in D.C. I went up there and opened my show by talking about that. You know, I, I would find in clubs, uh, there was a guy in Minnesota who used to, I forgot, it's further up north, this casino. He's long gone. Prairie Island? Is that a place called that? No, that's southeast of the Twin Cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember being there once long ago in the w- 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 indigenously challenged, that's the word we use, uh, guy booked the show, and he called my manager and he asked, "Can I do other things besides Indian material?" And I thought, so if I was black, I couldn't sing R and B. You know, it, it's like racist, colonialist, colonialist mentality. And I'm going, you know, he, how can I do something from his? I mean, what an asshole, you know. So, so when people are really creative, they let you do your your expression whatever way it comes out. And if something's good, it's good. Uh, um, I saw a woman the other day. They had some college conference here at the hotel, and she says she remembers seeing me once at University of uh, Marquette. I think it's a college college. I don't remember being there. I remember being there, but I don't remember the show. Is it like in the eighties, maybe seventies? And she says I remember you. Ran, she works there now, but then she was a student. And she says, I remember when you were there, you were running all these Catholics out of the room. And I said, I said, I remember some of that. That's happened. And she says, especially, she said, you remember when you were, we were talking about twirling the rosary and asking if Jesus would get dizzy? <laughs> and I said, I forgot all about that joke. And I said, Jesus, I have to do that again. But I used to do a thing. If you twirl a rosary, will he get dizzy? And she said, the Catholics, some of them start leaving the room. And I yelled out, hey, you have to forgive me. And that was always the callback on that. So I thought, once again, it's like somebody you mentioned that remembered me. When you tell me about this nine-year-old kid listening to a tape of mine, I thought, wow, that's that's a nice feeling, and I hope I didn't infect his mind. But Charlie Hill from the 70s? Oh, here's, here's another one. I remember uh, I, I knew this girl I went to summer school with when I was a, getting freshman credits, 18. And she was my pal, man. We were both, like, the youngest ones there. Everybody else were upperclassmen. She was uh, from Crow, no, Rocky Boy, Montana, and the Cree, right? And it was anyway. That's the summer everybody would 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 fight and fuck and drink and party in '49. I mean, that's that was that was it. 16, 1969. So years and years later, uh, I get hired by her daughter, who's now grown up. <laughs> And I said, you ready? You're, 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 you're Lou's uh, daughter? Wow, that's really cool. I knew her back in the day and blah, 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 blah. And I had a nice time because her daughter booked me and the show was good. And then I said, tell your mother hello, man. It was, that was a great time, all the students and on and on. And then I see her again, uh, this woman, this, this young woman, uh, uh, somewhere else. And I said, hey, did you see your mom? Did you tell her that, that I met you? And tell her Hello. She says, yeah, I saw my mom. I told her. I said, what'd she say? And she says, 
Charlie Hill, is he still around? I thought, oh God. <laughs> so like I'm saying, the alternative is, is not being around, so I like it. Shit. God damn. I remember Floyd, uh, he used to, uh, somebody came up to him once, and they said, actually said this to him. Didn't you used to be Floyd Westerman? <laughs> And then one time I was sitting there, uh, you know, uh, Carney, what's his name? Oh. Yeah, John Carney. Yeah. Good man. And I know he's a good man because one time he had an, a, a party at his house, and let Indians party there, and he didn't worry about anything getting stolen or the furniture. He was really cool. Usually white people have an Indian party after about an hour. They were wondering when the hell we're going to get out. And, uh, <laughs> and when that siren, that reminds me, you remember how many parties in your life when you got up the drum? Next thing you know, you heard that siren. <laughs> John Madison. Three nights in a row. Call the cops? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember in, in school once we, we uh, students were there, and the kids, shit, I might have said the story already too, but I'll say it again. But they're singing their frat songs and sorority songs, and we started 49, and and the cops came in the back of the room with their hands and their guns like like something, you know, like we're going to, oh, Jesus Christ. So, so uh, uh, I don't know where we're going with this. <laughs> no, no, we, we got five more minutes on the oh. tape if you got any. All right, well, you got to lead me. you got to lead me here. Oh, yeah, all I ask is you make it look more interesting, all right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, what is that? What th- there's that old joke where the guy's in bed with this girl. She says, well, "What are your, what are your plans for the future?" Well, I'm planning on figuring out how to get the hell out of here and forgetting your name. That's what my. <laughs> 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 yeah, we told jokes for five minutes. It was the other one I used to do a joke about my wife. I said the first time I met her, she says, "You got any protection?" I said, "Yeah, I got a shotgun in my." Pick up. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I heard one a while back. This Eskimo, his car breaks down in Window Rock, Arizona, and the Navajo mechanic says, "You blew a seal," and the Eskimo says, "So what? You fuck sheep." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you can say sheep on the air. Yeah. And uh, what do you get when you put 50 lesbians in a room with 50 employees in the Bureau of Indian Affairs? You get 100 people who don't do dick. <laughs> so those are the jokes that kept me out of the big time here. Yeah. There was the paranoid dyslexic he thought he was following somebody <laughs> what what did captain kirk find in the commode the captain's log no what did spock find in the in the commode the captain's log that's it oh. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you know what i learned was when i was uh, 18 19 i would collect all these jokes i knew a lot of them and from learning them, and it was mostly because I was learning how to be on radio, I taught myself how to write jokes. So when I came out to California, the jokes that they were telling when I was Charlie of the 70s, the, the hippie jokes, the drug jokes, were the same jokes that were drunk jokes or alcohol jokes, except they were dressed up different, but it was the same joke. And I was astounded how many comedians were doing these same old jokes, just made it look different. So from doing that, I learned how to... Uh, how to write it, write jokes, how to, how, to, how to set it up and put structure it. And that's one of the things I always was kind of proud that I learned. You know, I know how to, you know, that's it. You learn a trade, you come home, you help your people. Well, I know how to put together a joke. So if anybody wants to come over, I'll put together a fucking joke for you and your car will run better. I don't know. <laughs> So I, I think we better wrap it up. But once again, it's been more than a pleasure talking to everybody again. Uh, it's been an inconvenience. And uh hope to come to your community sometime. And uh, 
somebody slap Paul Domain, wake him up out of his coma, and tell him I said hello. All right. And uh, what's the, uh, the, one of the phony showbiz things was when they do that? I hate that. So I won't do that. Or, or this one. Or uh, back at you. I used to like when Ali would just kind of walk into the camera with his fist. Remember that? <laughs> Yeah, that's how I'll end it. I'll do it with Muhammad. <laughs> Ta -da. Hey, like that. Hey, hey, yeah, yeah. Cool. Mm. Well, we'll see what the main thing for the Look at, look at. Brett Favre. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Give me a second.